Um, <clears throat> well, great. Thank you so much, Father Robert, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's, it's really a privilege to be able to be back here at St. Pat's uh, after a number of years, you know, um, and having such a wonderful time on parish staff. Um, so I'm really thankful for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. So uh, the, the lecture tonight is titled Eucharistic Presence and the Indwelling of the Holy Trinity, uh, or the Eucharist and Trinitarian Communion. So what I want to do is talk through some ideas, first and foremost about the sacraments in general and the place of the Eucharist in Aquinas' thought in relation to the more general scope of the Summa, what sacraments are and how they relate to the incarnation and the human need for salvation, but then also distinguish within the concept of Eucharist, on one sense, um, the Eucharist is a sacrament, but then also the Eucharist is a sacrifice. I'm sure you're familiar, uh, at least in passing, with the Catholic doctrine of the sacrifice of the Mass and how important that was during the Reformation period. So I'll start by saying a bit about the medieval context for that idea, Aquinas' own approach textually and theologically to the sacrifice of the Mass. And then from there, uh, we'll also spend a bit of time in the second half of the lecture talking about 16th century context. So what happened in and around the time of the Reformation not only in relation to the reformers themselves, but also um, inside of Catholic theology, if you will, in, in terms of the way in which Catholic theology was developing up into uh, the Council of Trent, uh, but then subsequently also building on the Tridentine documents even into the 20th century. So in passing along the way, I also want to say a bit more about sacrifice itself, both as a human act understood as a certain type of virtue uh, in Aquinas' thought and how that gets related to Eucharistic theology by Aquinas, and then also the concept of grace uh, itself. Now, we could give a whole lecture, in fact, a whole course just on grace. I'm not going to do that tonight, um, but uh, I will say a little bit in passing because it's such an important concept for thinking about what the sacraments are even for, uh, why we need them, and what happens to us, right, uh, when we receive them, and how the sacraments play into a kind of teleology, if you will, a directedness in which human life and human activity is being moved towards uh, a deeper communion with the Trinity. So uh, I'll start in the first section just to, uh, talking about sacraments in the human person and the way in which Aquinas approaches that subject. So sacraments for St. Thomas are situated in the third part of the Summa, the Tertia Pars, which is the final division of the text as it stands. Uh, Aquinas actually didn't finish the Summa Theologiae, tragically. He died before he was able to complete it. But the original plan included not only a treatment of the incarnation and sacraments, but also a treatment of the last things, of eschatology, of the way in which everything gets drawn together in the love of God by the power of Jesus Christ in the second coming uh, with the resurrection of the dead. A lot of other scholastic texts, like Peter Lombard's Sentences, for example, um, many other sume of the, of the 13th century uh, featured this kind of structure. Uh, so there's a culmination, if you will, in, in the eschaton. But all of that begins for St. Thomas and also Alexander Pales, for example, uh, Peter Lombard, other authors of the scholastic period who wrote similar types of texts. All of this begins with a treatment of the nature of theology itself and a division between what St. Thomas will call things and signs. He's building on St. Augustine here. Uh, there's a lot of material in Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana, and then also his book on the Trinity, De Trinitate, uh, and lots of other Augustinian texts as well, that provides a kind of lexicon, if you will, or an organizational uh, principle, a set of hermeneutics for thinking about theology uh, as a science, thinking about theology as a pattern of Christian life that's in one sense drawn from the textuality of scripture, but in another sense is directed towards uh, a very intimate and personal communion with the Trinity, not only as individuals, but collectively as a church. So in Augustine, the things and signs distinction breaks down in the following way. So things, um, in one sense, it's what it sounds like. <laughs> it's the material world. Uh, it's the stuff of creation. It's the thing that we perceive uh, by the senses. So when we think about uh, any kind of sensory encounter with the world, you're all having one right now, as am I. Uh, so there's things, as it were, presenting themselves to the senses. But there's another sense in which signs become a kind of overlay uh, of things. This is a particular feature for St. Augustine of rational being. Um, there are certain types of animals and plants that don't quite do this in the same way. 
some types of animals have a, a certain type of, um, uh, let's say, less developed uh, subrational cognition about them. But signs are really related to universals. When you're able to say that uh, this giraffe is, a, is an example of a species. Uh, so there's something similar about all these animals, and it's called giraffe, right? Um, language is a great example of signs. So when you use language, we're using the English language right now, obviously. Uh, but there are other languages we could be using, right? French or German or whatever. Um, if, you're, if you were looking for that, you came to the wrong talk. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Um, but nonetheless, you know, there, there are different types of language systems, and they even grow over time. They, they build organically amongst themselves. But what it is effectively is an agreement about a sign. So how do you decide what word corresponds to what thing? Uh, the thing is the underlying reality itself, but then the, the word is a kind of sign imposed that speaks to meaning. Um, and what it is effectively is a repositioning of another thing to serve as a sign of the first thing. Uh, let me give you an example. Just the, the words I'm using now, they're intelligible as words, right? Um, but they're also noises, effectively, right? <laughs> so when you, if you ever listen to a language or try to listen to a language that you don't actually know, it's completely unintelligible, right? Uh, it's precisely because the signs aren't actually signs for you. They're effectively just sounds. They're just phenomena. So uh, signs are a way of repositioning things as signs of something else. Uh, that is to say, um, the uh, audible noises, right, uh, sound, can become a complex uh, reality of signs, a whole matrix of signs which helps different rational persons, two human persons, a whole society of persons, a whole history and culture of persons, to communicate amongst each other about not only giraffes or rocks or, or basic phenomena, but also really important ideas. Uh, precisely because signs have this ability to speak to universals and to get us thinking about uh, the heart of the matter uh, and talking about things that are most important. Uh, other types of physical things, visual elements, right, can also serve as signs. So stop signs, for example, or other types of communication of that kind. There's a kind of sign assembled from, you know, things. Uh, they're parts, so there's color, there's shape, but all of it comes together in a recognizable sign that says something tangible to us. Now, those are very practical and mundane examples. But again, there, there are species of sign that speak to the most uh, sublime elements of human experience, the most important things uh, that characterize the human person, not only individually, but in relation to each other. Uh, so things and signs, very briefly, Augustine uses this distinction in De Doctrina Christiana to talk about the way in which the Bible effectively stands at the heart of the Christian vocation as a collective reality, uh, drawing us all together as a church, uh, and draws us into communion with the Trinity. So that scripture itself is a sort of collection of things and signs. The things are the historical events, what happened historically in the Bible. Um, but then you have also a layer of signs. In one sense, it's the textuality of the literal sense, where the scriptural authors under divine inspiration are telling us about the things that God has done, the things or the deeds. Uh, it's really those events of salvation history that are the real things in question. Uh, the rest is kind of a matrix of communication of signs. And so St. Augustine uses this as a way not only to talk about how scripture works or how any text would work, but how a specially uh, divine inspired text can work. So what happens with sacred scripture in a special way is that the things can become signs of other things. Aquinas repeats all of this in the first question of the Summa when he's discussing the nature of sacra doctrina, the way in which theology works as he understands it. That is to say that the events of salvation history, all those words and deeds of God uh, with the Israelites in Egypt, all throughout the Old Testament, even the earthly life of Christ, which let's admit it was a long time ago, right? Uh, can be repositioned as signs of something else. Ultimately, for St. Augustine, it all comes together in charity, where the human person is perfected in the love of God, and the church collectively is perfected in the love of God as well as a single body. Um, I won't dwell on St. Augustine right now, uh, just in the interest of time, but he provides a kind of lexicon or a vocabulary for talking about things and signs that by the time of the high medieval West, and certainly the scholastic period, really provides a vocabulary for talking about sacraments, in one sense, certainly. Um, but before we go there, it's first and foremost a vocabulary for talking about 
a fundamentally Christian view of reality, an incarnational view of reality. So Hugh of St. Victor, for example, who was a medieval, a pre-scholastic uh, theologian, but someone who had a lot of influence on scholastic thought, uses St. Augustine's distinction between things and signs to structure the whole of theology as an exploration of scripture. So effectively, the, the first section, if you will, of Hugh's work uh, has to do with the work of creation, what God has done in creation. And there you have the historicity of the literal sense of scripture and salvation history, what God has done in creation, not only making things from nothing, but also being present uh, in salvation history. But the second sense, the spiritual senses of scripture, or the figurative senses of scripture, are really where Hugh um, starts to see a whole world emerging, uh, which is fundamentally theological. And it's by viewing the things that God has done historically, both in the act of creation and then the historical deeds of salvation history, by using the incarnation as a lens for viewing those as personally salvific realities, something that matters to me, uh, something that makes a difference for my salvation, that the signs, when viewed through faith of the church's life, certainly, um, and he'll use explicitly the liturgy, for example, uh, but scripture itself also becomes a sign not only of what was, uh, a vocabulary, a language for talking about what happened uh, 2,000 years ago, three, 5,000 years ago, but a language and a vocabulary for talking about what's happening to us today. It's a really significant move, um, you know, when you think about Hugh's approach that resonates certainly with Peter Lombard, who comes a little later. So he's a student of Hugh of St. Victor, actually, right? Uh, so the Victorine school in the 11th and 12th century has a, an outsized influence, let's say. I would almost say a univocal influence. <laughs> they're not the only influence on the scholastic movement, but they're one of the most uh, influential movements, partially because Lombard's sentences became the ubiquitous text that everyone commented on. Uh, so literally from the 13th century, or even a little before, up until the 15th century, no one studied theology without reading Lombard's sentences and commenting on his text. Now, it was also the type of text that lent itself well to that, rightly or wrongly. Every PhD student looked at it and thought they could do better. Um, <laughs> whether they were right or not, you know, is another question. Uh, but it, Lombard's important, right, because he sets the stage for the way in which Latin theology well into the 16th century, well into the early modern period, thinks about things like sacraments, thinks about the incarnation, and thinks about how material things, right, like oil, bread, wine, uh, the, ma the material, the visible, and then the auditory elements of something like the Eucharist, and really any of the other sacraments, can be repositioned as a sign, which is not just a reminder of something that Christ did, uh, although it certainly is that, but is its own kind of sign in its own right that speaks to the reality of the church today. Um, so we'll see, and Thomas Aquinas specifically has a lot to say about that in terms of how uh, the Eucharist is a sign of salvation for us in, in the context of what God is doing in the church now in the life of grace. So um, just briefly, you know, Lombard, building on Hugh, structures the whole of his sentences commentary, or rather the sentences itself, excuse me, <laughs> which other people commented on. Uh, structures it around things and signs, again. So the first three books of the sentences, right? Creation, uh, the incarnation, and the trinity, uh, those dogmatic subjects, if you want to call them that, are treated as the things. Book four is about the sacraments, and it's about signs. So in the medieval mind, the scholastic mind, sacraments are signs that are, if you will, made in a sense, right? Out of the stuff of salvation history, out of the stuff, if you will, of the material content of faith. So what do we believe about the Trinity? What do we believe about creation? We know some from natural reason in the case of creation, but the topic at hand for Lombard is certainly the doctrine of creation. Uh, that is to say, what we believe God has done in faith. Uh, and the same, of course, for the Trinity and the Incarnation, right? Um, so taking all that uh, in stride, some of that has to do with the theological virtue of faith, uh, and a certain gift uh, that's an infused gift that doesn't come from natural reason. But even there, the sacraments are a more specific declension uh, in relation to those wider or more general realities. So how does what we believe doctrinally in terms of the content of the faith? If you look at the creed, for example, I think you could raise the same question today. Now, I'm sure you all have intuitive answers uh, to it. Uh, how does it matter to me, right? Uh, the faith certainly does matter to me, right? Uh, it certainly does make a personal difference. Uh, 
but how does believing in the mysteries translate into our salvation, right? Um, in one sense, we're told, of course, uh, by Christ himself and by St. Paul and others uh, that we believe uh, that, that faith has a relationship, obviously, to our salvation. But how do the sacraments fit, right, in relation to that broader uh, sense of faith and the infused virtues of hope and charity as well? Well, they're effectively instrumental means by which the reality, and that's really grace, so I'll have a bit more to say about grace here in a moment. Um, they're really instrumental means by which those realities become personal ones, right? Uh, they're signs of what God is doing instrumentally, and we'll see with St. Thomas, it's really as a kind of uh, instrumental efficient cause uh, that God is affecting uh, grace within us, causing grace within us, uh, stirring up and coming, to, uh, coming into being, if you will, the, the whole life of, of, the, of divine uh, existence in the Trinity by a certain mode, right, uh, within the human person. Um, so sacraments are, are related to this distinction between things and signs. And they're in many ways a, um, a subset, if you will, of the larger mysteries of salvation history, which depend on divine institution. Uh, St. Thomas is very clear that uh, it's part of the ratio of salvation that they not be made up by us. Uh, he actually says, um, this has come back around in the last 50 years, maybe it's died down a little bit, but uh, there was a period there where people were, were let's say, experimenting to excess <laughs> with um, things that really are at the core of the faith itself um, and the tradition. Um, but uh, sacraments for Aquinas, now he says it, it's not impossible, right, that we could institute our own uh, ceremonies, and some of that has to do with the way in which all this relates to natural law and natural religion. Again, I'll say a little bit more about that later on, um, but it's unfitting, <laughs> right? Uh, and so it's not in fact the case that the sacraments are the product of a long development within church tradition. We came about them gradually or something like that. Uh, that it's, it's actually the humanity and the divinity of Christ, both in slightly different ways, by power of excellence uh, and power of authority, Aquinas will call it, uh, that the sacraments are instituted. So in one sense, Christ as God institutes the sacraments. In another sense, Christ in his humanity, which although it's the same humanity as ours, right, has a power of excellence about it. Um, this has a lot to do also when we think about grace in relation to the humanity of Christ. In many ways, we can think about the life of grace as a participation in the humanity of Christ itself. Now, we can say that generally uh, in the sense of grace uh, considered in its most general sense, but for the sacraments, it's really Christ as priest, right? Uh, and what he does in his humanity as priest, uh, particularly first and foremost on the cross, obviously, but in the Eucharist as well, Christ as high priest continues to perform a mode, and I'll say more about what that means uh, again moving forward, but a mode of the same offering that was offered on Calvary. And so the Eucharist provides us a particular moment to participate in the exemplar of Christ's humanity, certainly in a general sense, but in a more specific uh, and restricted sense in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So the Eucharist is a really privileged moment, not only because of the grace it affects within us, certainly that, but also as a sacrifice. Uh, it emerges as this special participation in the priesthood uh, that characterizes Christ's human offering in the flesh. Um, okay, so just a little bit more about the sacraments in general before we move on. Um, so when we think about the sacraments uh, in, uh, in a general sense, they're instituted by God, uh, according to Aquinas, uh, in a way which fits with the pattern of human need and human life. So again, way back at the beginning of the Summa in question one, Aquinas makes a big deal out of the fact that sacra doctrina, as he calls it, holy teaching, and again, that's a word he gets from Augustine, a phrase rather, he gets from Augustine, sacra doctrina. Uh, sacra doctrina um, is necessary because of the human need for salvation. That is to say, God doesn't need to share. <laughs> he doesn't need to share information, material information about himself, uh, that he's a trinity of persons, for example, or anything else uh, as such. Um, but we need, <laughs> right? Uh, we need to know. Um, and here again, uh, it's more than just information, right? Uh, here, and this is helpful, I think, uh, just to look at the virtue of faith. For, for St. Thomas, there's two dimensions of, of the virtue of faith. One's material and one's formal. Uh, now, the material aspect of faith is what, right? Uh, so there you can take the whole creed uh, and then the whole catechism, if you want, <laughs> and place it in that category. All the, the magisterial documents of the church, you could place it in that category too. What do we believe? 
but it could be just as simple as the, the Apostles' Creed, too, right? Um, but that's the material aspect of faith. The formal aspect of faith is God himself as a direct object. The other theological virtues of hope and charity also have him as a direct object, God himself as a direct object. Faith, materially speaking, is the difference between making claims about God, truth claims about God, which maybe the best of philosophers could do part of the time, um, and knowing God directly, right? So revelation gives us something more than just sort of an increase of information. It gives us a, a certain personal relationship. Uh, according to what Aquinas will say in a more technical sense, is a new mode by which God is related to the human person. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that. But in terms of sacra doctrina itself, it's that, that new mode of relating to God that satisfies the human need, the necessity that's only on our side, not on God's side, uh, for salvation. Uh, so what do we need fundamentally from God? Uh, we need the effects of original sin to be unraveled, as it were. Uh, so because of original sin, the human person has come apart at the seams, effectively, right? Um, so Aquinas will say that even grace, um, even before the fall, uh, before we even talk about the second coming and the resurrection of the dead and the elevation of, of the blessed to beatitude, that the human person needs grace at a certain level to hold us together, uh, to hold the passions in obedience to the higher nature and the whole, if you will, uh, of, the, of the rational person, including the highest faculties of knowing and loving, of intellect and will, uh, together in a unity and obedience to God. And that grace accomplishes some of that internal integration I think the, the general experience of original sin is a lack of integration, though, right? There's just a, a great deal of discord within our own experience of ourselves, sometimes, certainly our experience of ourselves as sinners. Um, but grace starts to repair that, and then at the same time starts to elevate it. That's why knowing and loving is so important for the life of grace. So why is revelation so important? Uh, it's not just because we need more information to satisfy our curiosity, right? Did you know that I was a trinity? God says, well, now you do, congratulations, right? There's, um, that knowing him personally as trinity, right, is actually the significant part. The material aspect is an entree into the formal one, right? So the, the stuff, the, the what we believe, is a means by which the formal relationship is actuated and stirred up. Um, so all that is just to say, you know, um, that there's a certain understanding of salvation and faith and love at work here, which is deeply ingrained in a certain understanding of the human person as image uh, of the Trinity. Now, Aristotle has a lot to say about the human person in a natural sense, but the Christian tradition has a lot to say about the same human person as an image of the Trinity. Uh, so the, very briefly, you know, the, if, the image within the person, uh, and this is going back to Augustine also, uh, it's not unique to Aquinas, the image is that rational faculty of knowing and loving, that ability to know and love an end. And a significant amount of the Summa Theologiae for Aquinas is taken up with exploring the trajectory of knowing and loving. So beginning in question one, when he asks about the necessity of salvation, uh, it begins as a kind of noetic answer. That is an answer in the order of knowing. Uh, so revelation begins uh, as a kind of gift in the mind. It's meant over time, however, to seep down through the effects of grace to accomplish gradually throughout our whole lives the reintegration of the human person, even the passions, even the emotions, uh, the reintegration of all of that into a new beatified trajectory, right? Uh, so a significant amount of the rest of the Summa Theologiae, if you fast forward into the, the portion on anthropology in the second part, and then the sacraments in the third part, has to do with the gradual noetic rehabilitation of the human person, learning to know and love God as final end. Um, so the sacraments fit into that pattern as a, a means by which that um, rehabilitation of the human person is accomplished. So the thread that connects the sacraments to the basic human need for salvation for St. Thomas is this sense of anthropological fittingness. That is to say that there's a deep, a deep human need for God uh, that is um, exacerbated by the fall, uh, particularly because of the effects of original sin. We have a, a particular need for God, not only um, to, to be in a kind of communion with him as the object of our knowledge and love, but also to fix, as it were, right, the effects of original sin. But that anthropological fittingness also 
um, not only characterizes the formal answer, but the means by which it's given. So there's a parallel for Aquinas, and again, this is a feature of the broader tradition, certainly looking back at Augustine, origin of Alexandria even. Uh, there's a parallel between the nature of scripture and divine revelation, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and the sacraments. And the parallel is simply this, that the way human nature is built, the way human nature is built to experience reality and know things um, is the constitutive element of each one of those uh, different separate realities, right? So scripture, why does it use words? Uh, why does it use examples? Even Aquinas spends a significant amount of time, this is again in question one of the Summa, a significant amount of time talking about why scripture would use metaphors. It's because they're, they're really appetible to the human intellect. They're great examples. <laughs> Metaphors work really well. They help people understand. Um, uh, and uh, they're, they're very accessible to the human intellect. So it's actually fitting that scripture use metaphors, that metaphors be the entree, even if eventually uh, scientific theology will want more precision, that the means by which the things, if you will, right, the realities of salvation history are communicated to us is through a medium of signs that are readily accessible to the human mind. The incarnation itself also, now God can do what he wants. He doesn't have to save us, right, at all. He doesn't have to save us the way he did. But it's fitting and wise, Aquinas will say, for God to save us particularly through the adoption of sensible signs. And so by taking on our human nature in a visible way, uh, the incarnation is a, a kind of sacrament, right? A kind of sacrament. Um, and so do the sacraments themselves make use of material things, uh, visible and tangible stuff that uh, forms the material instrument by which uh, grace is given. Now the term sacrament itself, um, by the high medieval West, the semantic field of the term, the meaning of the term, the dictionary definition of the term has been restricted significantly. In some ways that's good because it's become much more precise. So we're familiar of course with the big seven sacraments, right? Um, the sacraments you learned about in uh, catechism, certainly the sacraments enumerated by the Council of Trent, all that's true, right? Uh, sacramentum in Latin used to have a much, much broader valence, a much b wider range of meaning, which equally encompass things like the incarnation and scripture, signs in the world of faith. Um, and uh, so while it's important, I think, to certainly have the precision of the later tradition, it's there for a reason, right? You wouldn't want to blithely confuse <laughs> uh, the seven sacraments of the church with um, broader liturgical signs, as good as those are, they're not actually the sacraments, or with uh, scripture itself or something like that. There's obviously a distinction, but there's a conceptual unity which pivots around the human need for God uh, and for the salvation that he alone can offer. A and all of them are fitting means of achieving that salvation um, according to a similar pattern. So the anthropological question, if you will, right, when you think about um, the sacraments in general as fitting into a kind of pattern by which God is communicating salvation to us, uh, rebuilding intrinsically, right, a life of communion within us by the power of grace, fit together uh, according to a certain trajectory within salvation history in terms of what God has done in the process of revelation in scripture, what he continues to do in the church. It's a way by which things become signs, right? Uh, the sacrament of the Eucharist that you can receive today or tomorrow morning, right, is something deliberately given to you, right? Uh, just as the proclamation of scripture as a living word is something the church is given to you. Uh, they're signs that have a life of their own within the church. Uh, let me say a little bit more about that. Um, when we think about the Eucharist specifically, and Aquinas does this with all the sacraments, but the Eucharist specifically has its own realm of signs that are appropriate to it and stem from the fact of its divine institution. Just as the world of signs that scripture has it stems from its divine authorship, the same divine author, by instituting the material element of the Eucharist in bread and wine, for example, and not something else, um, you know, uh, it, it has a, a whole resonance within itself in terms of its symbolism, which while certainly built upon the witness of scripture, the data of scripture, certainly meant to reference that, is, is its own world of sign, which really pertains fundamentally, Aquinas says, uh, 
to the effect it's having in the recipients and in the wider church. So the Eucharist is a sign, Aquinas will say, of the past, present, and future. All sacraments are, but we're talking about the Eucharist for now, right? Um, so each of the sacraments has this kind of threefold pattern that pertains to the way in which the individual is, is being sanctified by contact with the sacrament. For the Eucharist specifically, it's sacrifice in the past, so it's a sign of Christ's sacrifice in the past. Uh, it's a sign of communion in the present, and then it's finally, it's, it's named viaticum uh, in terms of the reference towards the eschatological future of the church. It's named viaticum as food for the journey, right? So that threefold pattern of signification for Aquinas um, is a, a way by which the material signs of the Eucharist, the perceptible stuff of the Eucharist, uh, begins to signify the pattern of salvation that's happening in each one of us as a living reality and not just the pattern of what God has done in the past. Um, all of this is premised on uh, a more foundational anthropological dynamic, um, which can help us to transition a little bit into the idea of sacrifice. So I mentioned at the outset that you can think about the Eucharist as a sacrament and a sacrifice. Um, so these are related concepts, but actually distinct, right? So a, uh, a sacrament, I've been saying a lot about sacraments, but maybe to summarize that and pull that together, a sacrament, um, you may be familiar with the catechetical definition, it's an instituted sign, an efficacious sign to give grace, something like that. Uh, that's certainly true. It's a, Aquinas would say it's an instrument of Christ's humanity. So it's an efficient instrumental cause that is taken up by the humanity of Christ like a stick in the hand or a tool in the hand of a craftsman. Uh, just as the incarnation, his humanity, is conjoined, is united to his divinity. There are other things that aren't conjoined to his humanity in the same way, but are taken up as similar types of matter that form uh, instrumental extensions. So this baptismal water, this bread and wine in the Eucharist, taken up, as it were, sort of by the hand of Christ, if you want a, uh, an image for it, as a kind of instrumental cause that's affecting the purpose of the incarnation. So sacraments affect uh, the, um, the reality uh, achieved by the incarnation in the individuals who receive them. So sacraments give, sacraments come down, you might say. Sacrifices are human acts, though, right, uh, by which a return to God is made. Now, in the Eucharist, the premier sacrifice, of course, is Christ himself. Uh, we wouldn't ever want to say anything that would overshadow or, or minimize that, of course. Uh, it's really Christ's sacrifice that we're participating in, in the Eucharist. But what makes Christ's sacrifice uh, a fitting anthropological reality, just according to the, the makeup, if you will, or structure of human nature, is the idea of sacrifice itself as a human act, right, uh, under natural law. So just a little bit about that. So Aquinas describes sacrifice as a moral virtue, um, which is, uh, well, there are, there are theological species of the moral virtues. They have a place in the theological life but you don't have to have the infused virtues of faith, hope, and charity. You don't have to have grace. You don't have to have the creed or the life of the church to have moral virtues. Uh, moral virtues really govern the practicality of human action as it relates to external realities. So intellectual virtue um, and the theological virtues in the infused life of faith, hope, and charity are in a, in a lot of ways intellectual realities. They divinize the acts of knowing and loving, right, in the mind, the intellect and will. But of course, since grace is meant to reintegrate the human person, our ability to commit practical acts that flow from that instrumentally is really important. It's actually a sign of the fall and the disunity of the fall that that's hard for us to do. It's not so easy, right? Um, we have good intentions, we believe the content of the creed, and then we do things that are, let's say, mediocre <laughs> or even you know, uh, openly contradict right? Uh, what we say we believe. Um, that type of disunity, right, is a, um, just a feature, I think, of, of post-lapsarian life. But, you know, when you think about um, the moral virtues, uh, you, religion itself is situated within justice for Aquinas. So it's, um, it's a potential part of the virtue of justice, which means that you need justice as a, as a larger concept to help you define what religion is. Uh, religion is really about the practical acts. It has some internal ones, too but a lot of it is about external activity um, that orient us towards God, right? 
So religion begins, and this is before we even talk about faith or theology or Christianity. Religion begins in justice with a certain debt to God, uh, that by being creatures, uh, something is owed to God, um, and that we should make a fitting return. And the best part is, the, the key here, right, is that because it's a moral virtue, that return needs to be something a little more practical and concrete. It's not enough just to say, oh, I believe, you know, and then do nothing about it, right? Um, <laughs> uh, that religion implies a practical uh, teleology. Something should be done. Uh, it's why you can see religion in, in almost every human culture. Um, it's recently disappeared from the public square, but I think that's been like 50 years or less, right? Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. Um, uh, because it's not natural, right? Um, it's not very natural at all. Almost every other culture has some version of religion, and, and you can point to it and say that's the religious part, just intuitively. It's actually pretty easy, even if you don't have a theory behind it. Like, that looks like religion to me. I'm not sure why, but that part with the ceremony and the, <laughs> you know, whatever they're up to there. Um, there's some other distinctions that Aquinas makes that are helpful here when we think about religion in a natural sense, and that has to do with the vices of religion, right? Uh, so uh, two main categories here. He has a whole list of more specific vices, but two basic, dis ba basic ways you can get religion wrong uh, would be by missing the object, uh, that is worshiping the wrong thing. So you're supposed to worship God, but you end up worshiping a tree <laughs> or something. Or, um, uh, so that's idolatry, right? Uh, superstition is about the means, though. If you got the object right, but the way to do it, that's the part that you got wrong, right? So uh, maybe you got the God part right, but then, well, what should we do about it? Well, you know, uh, you know and the idea is a little half-baked, right? <laughs> and um, uh, doesn't really uh, actually achieve the end of worship. So, uh, you know, and these are, these are certainly dangers even, you know, with, within our own life of faith, too, that uh, some uh, confusion about the mean, for example, you know, could affect our, our own life in one way or another in a practical sense. Uh, but when you think about liturgy, particularly in the context of the church's life, it builds upon this basic anthropological framework, this need for worship, and also a fundamental question of what what should be done. Uh, it's actually not so obvious. Uh, it's one thing to intellectually recognize uh, that God is first principle. Let's say you made it that far, according to natural reason. Uh, and that's saying a lot. Even the best of the Greek philosophers, mm, you know, missed, missed the mark uh, in various ways, right? Uh, but let, let's say that a, a given culture or society has managed to recognize that. Uh, the next part, what should be done practically about it? Aquinas actually says, and here he's actually building on Cicero and some other ideas from Roman thought uh, and other classical models, it, you actually need positive law to specify the what uh, in a practical sense. So what should be done um, in terms of the external acts of religion? Um, that's partially why uh, religious law is actually a feature of Roman society, for example. It's actually a species of positive law for the Romans and for Cicero. It's also why for Aquinas and Augustine, he's building on Augustine here, Augustine's city of God. It's why um, the covenants, right, first the old covenant with Moses, but then the new covenant in Jesus Christ, fit this anthropological need um, that in a general sense, we can talk about grace and sacra doctrina, but what about the practical? What should we do? <laughs> how, should we, how should we respond? How should we act? Um, the covenant of Moses, first and foremost, and then now the covenant we enjoy in Jesus Christ, provides us fitting means of worship, right? Uh, the law of Moses is very complicated. If you've ever read through Leviticus uh, from one end to the other, there are a lot of rules. <laughs> and it's all about external behavior, how to do it, what not to do, when to do it, right? Um, Aquinas will say when he's commenting on um, the ceremonies of the old law, this is in question 102 of the Prima Secundae, that um, that's basically um, centered in natural law uh, uh, in terms of getting religion right. So avoiding the vices of religion, uh, so not lapsing into idolatry or superstition. How much of the law of Moses is concerned with that? Definitely don't go over and do whatever the Amalekites are doing. Whatever you do, don't go over there. <laughs> don't ever go over there and do that. Um, you know, but what should you do? Do this and nothing but this in nothing but this way, right? Uh, so, in its literal sense, right, the, the law of Moses is uh, a kind of right ordering of the virtue of religion, that natural human need to worship in a practical way. Uh, 
and to express our belief in God, our recognition of him as creator. Uh, in its figurative sense, though, it contains Christ as prefigured in an allegorical sense. Um, and so when we think about the new law fulfilling the old, it also contains a set of positive prescripts and very practical directives, in a sense, right, that um, instruct us about what should be done. Um, and so we can think about the church's liturgy and the sacraments specifically uh, in this vein. To distinguish between the two, sacraments, of course, they're divinely instituted. Liturgy falls into what Aquinas might call custom, right, which is long-standing practice. Uh, so we trace the liturgy back to apostolic times. It's a long-standing practice in the church. It's the environment in which the sacraments live. And uh, Aquinas will actually compare the liturgy to an accident in relation to a substance. So if you think about uh, a certain thing uh, and then qualitative observations about how it is, how it behaves, how it's situated in its natural environment, the liturgy is kind of that outer shell, which is the observable part, the, the part that appeals to the senses, right? Um, just like any other collection of accidents in a natural space. So um, when we think about sacrifice in this context, sacrifice is one of the external acts of the virtue of religion, right? Uh, and it involves uh, effectively, now it comes in a couple different forms, but it involves a change in what's offered. It involves a change. Uh, so there are other types of offerings. Aquinas goes through all the, all the offerings of the Old Covenant, and even the other uh, things that are termed sacrifices in various ways. Some things are oblations, where there's something offered but there's nothing done to the offering, right? Uh, a sacrifice, the premier example is the Holocaust offering, where the whole um, of the offering is burnt up, right? And nothing remains. Uh, there are other types of sacrifices, um, you know, just, just looking at the Old Covenant that Aquinas identifies where there's some portion of the offering reserved, perhaps for the use of the priest or of the people, so they'll take part of it home, right? Um, th those are sacrifices in a sense, but less perfect ones than the Holocaust offering. So that Holocaust offering becomes the kind of model allegorically for St. Thomas for thinking about the passion of Jesus Christ and ultimately thinking about our participation in the Eucharist as well. It's that whole burnt offering right, uh, by which uh, what's placed on the altar is offered entirely right, to the Lord. Um, so just to fast forward a, a little bit, just in the interest of time, um, we've talked about sacrifice in a natural vein. And here, I think, you, you can see sacrifice all over natural religion. Uh, that shouldn't actually be that surprising to us. Again, you won't find it in the public square of our own culture, right? But um, if you uh, look at almost any other culture, classically speaking, you'll find that the natural unfolding of religion, like they came up with sacrifice somehow, right? Now, sometimes it gets a little weird, too, but um, it's also uh, pretty consistent, right, anthropologically speaking. Um, so the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in this sense uh, is a salvific event, of course, for us, uh, designed by divine providence and divine wisdom. God didn't have to do any of this. He didn't have to do it in this way. But what he does do is fitting and wise, uh, according to the pattern of, of sacra doctrina. And, and so it fits with the human person. So not only does sacra doctrina, in the broad sense, communicate sacred truth to the intellect, it also instills a, a pattern of activity right, uh, that translates into the practicality of the moral virtues. And so the exemplar of Christ on the cross becomes something that we imitate. Certainly we imitate his sacrifice and charity in our own lives and our pouring out of ourselves in various forms of service. Um, but liturgically, right, uh, it really becomes a means of worship that's been instituted as a constitutive part of the Eucharist. So building on the notion of the Eucharist as a sacrament, there are all sorts of ways in which sacrificial language is woven into the celebration of the Mass. St. Thomas actually spends a lot of time in his treatment of the Eucharist and the Tertia of Pars in thinking about how the twofold matter and then also the twofold consecration of the Eucharist forms an image of the passion of Jesus Christ. This goes back to the idea that the Eucharist is a sign of the passion, but a sign for us. Right? Um, so if you um, think about the Mass in your own experience, I'm sure you've noticed that unlike any other sacrament, there's two matters. So the, in, for, uh, in comparison to baptism, for example, it's just water. It's not water and something else. But the Eucharist has two, uh, bread and wine, right, as, as the matter for the Eucharist. But then also a twofold consecration, 
So the priest consecrates the bread first and then the wine, right? <laughs> uh, so you get the body of Christ and then the blood of Christ. Um, Aquinas, you know, and this becomes really important in the early modern period for Cardinal Cajetan and other uh, later Dominican commentators on Aquinas. Uh, but Aquinas himself sees this image of the passion of Christ uh, in the twofold consecration. So just as Christ's body and blood were separated physically in his passion um, on the cross itself, in the Eucharist, you have a sign of that separation, right? So the twofold matter um, with the body becoming present under the, uh, under the species of bread and then the blood under the species of wine is a kind of sign of the passion. Now, all that is in the realm of sacrament because the whole Christ is present under both. Uh, the, by the power of transubstantiation, it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ that's present by concomitance in both places. Right, uh, so it's not that he's not actually divided in any sense, right? Uh, but by sign, uh, the liturgy and specifically the sacramental signification of the Eucharist is meant to remind us by sensible means of what Christ has done in the Passion. But it's also forming um, a, a kind of sacrifice in the realm of sign, right then and there. Um, so in terms of the sacrifice of the Mass, when we think about the Mass as a sacrifice we can make a couple distinctions. One would be that the Mass is a sacrifice as a sign of what Christ has done. So when we think about what's happening there in the twofold consecration, it signifies the past. But it's also something that the priest is doing, the, as in consecrating one and then the other. So there's a human act there, right? Um, it's not a separate sacrifice from Christ, but a participation in his. So as Alter Christus, the priest is effectively standing in the place of Christ to perform the sacrifice, to, to uh, confect the sacrament there. And so as a human act, you can see something that's offered, right? First and foremost by the priest himself, right, who's celebrating the mass. Um, this also has a lot to do with charity, and I'll close with that and, and the role of the lady in that case in relation to the mass too. But just to think about the event of the consecration itself, right, as a kind of uh, once it's a sign or a symbol of Christ's passion, but also a kind of sacrificial event, right? Um, in question 83 of the Tertia Pars, Aquinas expands on this a little bit uh, when he talks about the rite of the Eucharist and the way in which he, he goes through the whole structure of the Mass from one end to the other, right, uh, and looks at the whole thing. But he asks uh, here in 83 whether the Mass is an immolation of Jesus Christ, whether Christ is immolated or sacrificed in the Mass. And he says that happens in two ways. Right? Uh, one is by sign, and the other is by effect. So in the first case, in sign, uh, if I were to point to uh, a painting um, of, uh, there we go, there's our Holy Father right there. Um, you know, I could say there is Pope Francis, right? And I'm not wrong. It's a painting of Pope Francis, right? But, uh, but it's, also, um, it's also a true statement that he's present by means of the symbol, right? So the twofold consecration in particular, but then all the other ways in which sacrificial language and symbolism is woven into the mass is a way of making the crucifixion of Jesus Christ present to us. Uh, so the example that Aquinas uses is a painting of Cicero or of Salst, right? Uh, so that there is Cicero, right? Uh, it's a true statement, but it's predicated in a certain way, right? It's, uh, he's not physically in the room, but he's there by sign. Uh, the other is by effect, right? Uh, and so that the sacrifice in the virtue of charity is brought to bear in its recipients. Uh, what he doesn't mention in 83, partially because he's already mentioned it in 75 and 76 uh, earlier, is that by the real presence of Jesus Christ as well in the Eucharist, uh, you have Christ crucified present. Um, so it's Christ having been crucified. Uh, the grammar in the Latin is actually pretty clear on this. It's, it's the Christ who was crucified, the, 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 huma the same humanity of Christ that was crucified, that's present in the Eucharist. But still that is, a, in a certain sense, a past reality. His presence is real, right? But in terms of sacrifice, uh, and thinking about the Mass itself as a sacrifice, that's again a, a kind of reference to the past, right? Um, what makes the, the Mass a living sacrifice uh, for Aquinas, something that we can participate in, is uh, not only the signification, but the effect. That's really the key. Um, all the sacraments have an effect on us. The Eucharist has a specific effect on the virtue of charity, though. Uh, it's certainly, it's called the sacrament of charity. 
Uh, sometimes you hear that sacraments and caritatis, right, referred to in that kind of language. But uh, the way in which the Eucharist affects charity is both to strengthen the habit of charity on one hand, uh, and also to move it to act, right? Uh, now, um, without getting too deep into the weeds, all the sacraments cause all the theological virtues and, and the whole reality of grace. So it's not as if baptism doesn't cause charity, right? But also Aquinas uh, is pretty clear that there's a sense in which you can talk about a kind of appropriation of certain theological virtues to certain sacraments. So there's a special relationship between the Eucharist and the, and the specific infused virtue of charity, not only in the realm of symbolism, uh, but in the effect conferred. Um, I have more to say about that, but I won't. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of literature on Aquinas on grace um, and the sacraments that uses m modal language, right, uh, in terms of the one and the many, to talk about how the sacraments are, are various instruments by which the one reality of sanctifying grace is communicated. Uh, but the, the takeaway here is that charity is the focus of the Eucharist, right, in a special sense. Um, so it causes both the habit and the act of charity. Now, the habit, of course, is where everything starts. If you're in a so-called state of grace, you have the habit of charity. Um, but that doesn't mean we're doing much with it, right? <laughs> it could just be just habit, right? Um, but the Eucharist is really designed to move, uh, to move us to a greater act of charity. Now, Aquinas, um, I this is again, you know, in, in 79, and, uh, 78 and 79 of the Tertia Pars, if you're interested. But he has a lot to say about the, the way in which devotion here will prepare us for a deeper experience of charity, a deeper act of charity in the Eucharist. Um, and when we think about ourselves as performing a kind of sacrifice, that language of devotion in relation to charity in the context of Christ's sacrifice, it takes us straight back to the virtue of religion. The first act of, of the virtue of religion internally is devotion. Devotion and then prayer. Um, and when you think about that in a theological context, in the context of our life in Christ, uh, all of that, that devotion and prayer, is a, is a precursor to the external acts of sacrifice, for example. Uh, Aquinas also talks about bodily reverence, which is a, a very broad category. It includes everything you do at church, kneeling, bowing, standing up, sitting down, ways in which we use the externality of our bodies to show reverence to God. Um, but sacrifice is one of those external acts, right? Again, but devotion prepares for it. Um, and even the external acts are really signs of the internal ones. So when we think about devotion in relation to charity and the act of charity, there's actually an intrinsic connection at the level of human nature there, right? That, um, that fits again with the anthropological pattern of the sacraments, of sacra doctrina, of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And so uh, charity itself is proportioned in its effect, in its Eucharistic effect, to the devotion that we bring in the life of grace. Right? Um, Aquinas also talks about the uh, reality of venial sin in relation to the Eucharist. Obviously, if we're in a state of mortal sin, we're not disposed to receive the Eucharist. We need to go to confession first, of course. Uh, but venial sin is such a broad category, right? Uh, it includes everything from things which were almost mortal sins, but weren't quite, right? All the way to things that almost weren't sins at all, but just quite, just barely are, right? Uh, pretty broad spectrum. Um, so, uh, and it includes all sorts of matter too. Some of the matter is grave, that's a serious thing, even though it was almost not your fault, but it still is a serious thing, right? Um, to things that really don't matter very much at all um, from one perspective, but could be done with a, a real, a real kind of malicious intent uh, for no, no good reason at all, right? And, and so venial sin is a really broad category. Uh, Aquinas is clear uh, because of the way in which repentance works as uh, a virtue itself, the virtue of penance, that um, venial sin in relation to the externalities of the liturgy is forgiven by an act of repentance, and that can be key to external signs. He even mentions signing yourself with holy water, for example, uh, but certainly the penitential rite of the mass is designed to uh, liturgically signify and also draw us into, invite us to perform an act of repentance, right? Uh, that achieves the turn away from our attachment to venial sin. How many times do we just sort of blow through that without thinking too much about it, without praying it with devotion? It's an opportunity though, right? It's a real opportunity to rid ourselves of the attachment to venial sin that if it remains becomes an obstacle to growth and charity and an obstacle to the fruit of the mass we're actually taking part in, right? Um, 
Aquinas is clear, though, that uh, just the fact of past venial sins, certainly, again, mortal sin is another category. We need to go to confession first. But uh, the fact of past venial sins don't in and of themselves inhibit the act of charity and the reception of the fruit of the Eucharist. It's actual venial sin, right? Um, so he actually spends a significant amount of time on this in 79, right? That, um, that the act of venial sin itself, um, and that, again, is such a broad category, but uh, our distractions, uh, the grudges we harbor, right? <laughs> All sorts of other things in that category uh, that can distract us and occupy our mind. Because they sort of unravel and cheapen the act of devotion, uh, the effect of the Eucharist is real. It strengthens the habit, though, and we miss out on the act of charity and the corresponding joy that comes from uh, the, the actual enjoyment uh, of God as, as object that charity is meant for. And um, so when we think about the sacrifice of the Mass and our participation in it, um, it's really according to the unfolding pattern of charity as an expression of the virtue of religion, right? Uh, moving from devotion to external sacrifice. And the externalities of the liturgy, the matter of the Eucharist, the symbolism of the Eucharist, obviously its effect as well, <laughs> and the real presence that contains uh, the means by which that effect is coming to us. Uh, all of that um, is really a context for, right, participating more deeply. Not as if we're offering a sacrifice of our own, but by participation in the virtue of charity, we're uh, participating in Christ's own saving sacrifice um, in a way that draws us as human persons, as persons capable of acting uh, towards God and for God as our final good uh, in a way which is divinizing and life-giving. All right, I'll stop there. Our help is in the name of the Lord. All right. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time. Um, thank you. So, Father can take some questions now. Uh, Any, uh, anything's fine. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Father, thank you very much. It was very energizing and very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Again. And uh, there's one comment that really stuck with me about uh, sacrifice is a central part of every religion. Yeah. Except Today, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, would I don't know where to I, find I, it. Yeah. First of yeah. all, I think that's that's right, correct, and everything else. And I, I would say that today, mm -hmm. you know, the 1980s they talk about we had moved, we're in secular humanism, and today we've moved to neo paganism. Mm -hmm. I would think that abortion mm -hmm. and murder and stripping of property rights, all these are sacrifices mm -hmm. in this neo paganism. I think sometimes when you, I, the way idolatry works, it's, it's more obvious when it's someone else's golden calf, right? You know, like, uh, but like, you know, this seemed like a really good idea uh, to some of the Israelites at the time, right? Um, so uh, the, the way in which the vices of religion get sort of culturally manifested and work their way into our collective psyche can be kind of insidious, right? And hard to identify from within the cultural matrix itself sometimes. So. Yeah, uh, sometimes the benefit of history and also just divine intervention <laughs> to sometimes points it out, right? Like this, this is not right, you know, th this is not giving worship. But I think we, in a more secular society, you really have the risk that there's no conscious acknowledgement personally or collectively that God should be the object, that worship should be the point. So if we're doing it, we're doing it by accident, right? You know, uh, and... Yeah, I think, um, I, but that need is still there. I think apostolically and evangelically, we can tap into that. You know that there there is fundamentally, no matter what uh, sort of cultural messaging there may be to the contrary, there is a fundamental human need for religion. And um, yeah, you know I, I, that's that's not going anywhere. So um, I think the trick is for us, you know, the church to make sure that we're um, presenting ourselves in a way that shows that that need is authentically being met, that it exists. But it's life giving, you know. And it's uh, a human need. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Let's see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yes. And he said, this is my body. Mm -hmm. You know, it was Banner Day. Mm -hmm. Alan's back in the mountain. Um, it strikes to me that he said, take this and eat it. Mm -hmm. Take this and drink it. Mm -hmm. And it, sometimes it seems, I understand that there is a nice to do, as we document in comics. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. But it, it seems not to honor the material and the direct mm -hmm. words of the writer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think, mm -hmm. with all practical matters aside, yeah. we ought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, Aquinas spends a lot of time on the grammar of that phrase, the, the form for this, then the twofold form, take this, all of you, and eat of it. Take this, all of you, and drink of it, right? The, uh, that there's both an accidental and a substantial reference. And he, he spends all of question 75 and into 76 in the Tertia Pars talking about how this works and, and describing transubstantiation as a, a real conversion of substance. Uh, not like uh, analogically compared to natural transmutation. So the, you normally in natural transmutation, a tree decays and becomes dirt, for example, or, uh, or uh, fire consumes a house. Uh, but this transmutation happens inst instantaneously, and there's no matter, there's no material substrate. No argument yeah, that yeah. I yes, yeah. Yes. You know, material level. Yeah. You know, that's the level at which I think we're a little lacking in the uh, yeah. strength. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I understand that I'm not the Euripides, you know, sure. take on all the practical problems of yeah, yeah, yeah. other characters. Well, and, and you know, uh, um, it's in the Eastern Rite, of course, the various Eastern Rites, uh, or they're commingled, the species are commingled. Um, they have less frequent communion sometimes, too, though. So, it, uh, but. Uh, the the Roman argument is one simply of practicality, not not of uh, that. That's the, basically the um, reason for the Roman practice uh, in terms of distribution of the species. But the in terms of the form, the where the this always refers to the accidents remain. So it's the accidents of bread that you see this, and the dimensive quantity they occupy. So the the bread that takes up this spot, <laughs> as opposed to the host right next to it or the thousand other hosts in the tabernacle. You know, it's it's this. So there's a, the sacramental part of it, though, is the, the this is something you can eat, right? It's something you can consume. It's, it's not that host. It's, it's, it's this one, right? And, and even then the form of communion mirrors that. To the, you know, this is my body, right? You know, so uh, the body of Christ, right? There's a, there's a direct reference there. Usually those things would refer to the same substance if it wasn't um, transferred into the body of Christ, if you didn't have... Uh, the the conversion that happens in in, um, in the in the in the substantial conversion that happens in the Eucharist and the consecration, if you just had a piece of bread, the this uh, and the uh, the substantive s, th th this is you know, it would all just be this bread, right? But in the case of the Eucharist, the this is the appearance, and then the is is the substance that we don't see underneath, which is the presence of Christ. So it's a one-off case, uh, but. In some ways, it underscores the mystery, though, right? That something so tangible and so common, in one sense, could be the means by which God feeds us with his own flesh as food and spiritual drink, right? And uh, so, um, but that wouldn't be possible. It wouldn't be consumable, right? If, if there weren't a this, as it were, right? So, um, again, God doesn't have to do any of this, but he, he does it in a way that fits anthropologically with our actual need for him and in a way that works through our senses, a way that we can... Well, relate to intellectually, but also, um, you know, makes use of, let's say, the uh, instrumentality of the human body as well, and the senses and, and all of that. Uh, so there's a complex world of signs in the Eucharist that built on eating. We didn't talk about that as much, just for interest of time, but that notion that uh, this is a, a kind of bodily food, right? Um, Could you yeah. Question very briefly? Sure. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I talked a little bit about the the Trinity and grace at the beginning, but you're right to bring that full circle. Um, uh, 
the, uh, the, the Trinity itself is the exemplar for the human person as image. Uh, so the, that's in Augustine, that's in Aquinas. When you think about the powers of the human soul of knowing and loving, that that's uh, um, the, the same powers in the divine nature are the means by which you can arrive at three Trinitarian persons without a, dis uh, a division of substance, which takes a long time in the Summa. We won't go through all that now, but the, there's a basic correspondence of image and likeness. But then in 43, question 43 of the Prima Pars, the whole concept of grace is about Trinitarian indwelling. So there's a, a mode by which God's relation to the creature changes not um, entirely, but a, almost a shift of valence or a shift of range uh, where now instead of just by power and essence, the way God is present to everything he's made, um, that by indwelling, uh, that sanctifying grace is the indwelling of the Trinitarian persons uh, in, in the human soul as in a temple. Um, and so when we have that perspective, charity is a kind of perfection of that. So. He, it, it, rather than a static reality, like, like the picture of the Pope or something like that, it's a, it's a kind of expandable image. And he says in 43, it's, it's an image towards, ad imaginum. We're, uh, the human nature grows in image and likeness. You know? And so the whole point of the theological life and the whole point of the instrumentality of all the sacraments, but especially the Eucharist, has to do with, with growing the image as, as a form of participation in divine life. So. Charity, I'm glad you brought that up because that's an important uh, connection to make, um, that th the notion of charity as a theological virtue is really the form of all of that, the ultimate perfection of all that. You know? So it's a lot. I mean, when you think about what's going on with each one of us in communion when we're receiving the Eucharist, what's, what's possible, what God intends for us, right? Uh, there's, uh, it's, it's an incredible gift, really, you know, that, that continues to be present throughout our whole lives. Yeah, 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 I agree, yeah, <laughs> that's it, uh, let's see, yeah, or, uh, sorry, okay, yeah, go ahead, okay, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, it's the means, like, let's say you got the object right, but you, you know, like, you end up doing something that's, not very reverent or something that's, you know, a little weird. Um, <laughs> some examples from history, right, would be, um, let's say, uh, you know, it's interesting, there were some anthropological studies done in the early 20th century. Um, I think of Eva, Eva, E. Evans Pritchard, for example, uh, was at Oxford, um, who studied some of these isolated tribes in Africa that were, at that time, there were more, more groups like this that were uncontacted. You could find these whole religious worlds that looked a lot like uh, Leviticus, like a lot like they've got a liturgical calendar, they're sacrificing cows. Are there vices of religion ingrained in their praxis? It's not obvious that there are. Uh, now, individuals might have them, but of course the difference between that and the Mosaic law and certainly the law of the gospel is that it's not salvific, right? There, there's no infused theological virtues, there's no life of grace, but there is this kind of human impulse to build a religious world there are examples, certainly, of religions. So, so natural religion, it's different in kind from salvific and theological religion that we have uh, in, in faith, right? Um, but uh, it's possible, at least in theory, right, that it, it could, again, I think original sin will find a way to mess it up, probably, right? Um, but uh, in, in theory, that it could uh, have a, a, a relative goodness of its own. Not salvific, uh, but, but a relative goodness. There are plenty of examples of, of ways in which natural religion has gotten a little weird, though. So human sacrifice, for example, in the Spanish South Americas. Um, this was actually a major controversy at the University of Salamanca in the 16th century. So after, sort of after the fact, so early 16th century, right? The, the Spanish go over, you know, steal all the gold, right? <laughs> you know, uh, and well, enslave a lot of people too. A lot of, you know, real injustices, to say the least, perpetrated. But then they come back, and so Salamanca, the university, for uh, quite some time had a long-running uh, intellectual conversation about the uh, merits and demerits of this action. Uh, but it has to do with international law and natural law, the rights of persons. A lot of our modern rhetoric of rights and in international law comes out of the Salamanca debates in the 16th century as kind of an adaptation of Aquinas, a kind of, and, and other classical sources. But uh, the point being that um, 
the Dominican tradition there, uh, particularly Bartolomeo de las Casas is the most famous, but um, Vittoria, uh, Francisco de Vittoria and other earlier figures really kind of um, develop all the principles that Las Casas uses, uh, but that you really use the vices of religion to explain this. It's not that they're subhuman. So the, the evidence of, of human sacrifice isn't for, uh, the, the argument was advanced that it's so bad, uh, which it is very bad, don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's, but it's so bad that it's evidence that they're subhuman. Therefore, conveniently, they don't have rights and they can't own property. So it wasn't their gold anyways, you know, right? We just sort of found it. Um, and uh, now, you know, it, the right thing to do is for us to take custody of it, right? And uh, um, <laughs> so, I mean, that's a self-serving argument to say the least, uh, but, but uh, by Aquinas's principles, the argument made was that the vices of religion, uh, but particularly superstition, they're, now they might be confused about the object also, but that's a practice that's really objectionable, right? And, and isn't giving worship at all. So there are sort of different ways in which religion might go wrong, let's say, you know? Yeah. Is, is it? Yeah, so this is Secunda Secunda 81 and following. So religion is 81, and then he goes through the acts of the virtue of religion, and then subsequently the vices after that. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So it's really um, in the same way that language and po yeah. Yeah, oh, th yeah, oh, thanks for, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the, the question is how much correspondence there is between the sign and the thing. So there's that thing and sign distinction, you know, that I was talking about at the beginning. And in one sense, the sacraments are material things, bread and wine, but then there's the sign, right? It's not unlike language that makes creative use of things in ways that, while not unrelated to the thing itself, is really, you, you need the kind of imposition of language <coughs> to make the symbolic world what it so is. Language is the yeah. Is that where positive law comes in? Yes, yeah, or custom. So language could, I mean, it's not usually enforced by, well, I, there are some descriptive norms about language, like the Oxford English Dictionary, but that's mostly sort of after the fact observations about what is done. So it's sort of a catalog of custom, you know, in a lot of ways. There, there are certain things where there's positive law, like a stop sign. That's, so there are rules. Uh, I mean, they all look the same for a reason, right? Everywhere in the US. And they look a little different in Europe. It's recognizable, but it's also obviously the language is different. But like, I'm pretty sure that's a stop sign, but it's round. Uh, I think this is a place to stop. So I mean, <laughs> but, but there's a positive law that just says, this is how we do it here. Um, but there you're, you're repositioning colors and things like that that are associated with the idea stop. It's a fitting repositioning, but you really need the linguistic imposition to get a sign. So um, unlike natural signs, uh, which some things don't need language, like uh, all of creation points to God as first cause without you know, us developing a language to say so. But when we start to reposition <coughs> material things like a rock as, a, as an image of strength, or something, which is, I think, a reasonable, you know, reasonable connection. Maybe, right? You could, uh, you could certainly get there from there. Um, but you, you, you've started to impose meaning uh, that's in the sign. So some of the meaning is in the sign. Uh, and, and so the fact that they're divinely instituted, the sacraments, in the case of the Eucharist, what's been divinely instituted is not only the this, but the symbolic world around it, right? So that uh, th this is the matter, but then this is the form too. So the the form is really the, the spoken words, right? Take this, all of you, and eat it. But you're getting a lot of the symbolic imposition really from the form also, right? So what is it we're talking about? It's not just bread from the cupboard or something. I mean, this is, this is a, a certain kind of sign that's making use of a material reality. But um, so there's always a fitting correspondence, but you wouldn't get there without the imposed sign and without, in this case, really divine law supplying a, a matrix of signs that's designed by divine wisdom to draw us more deeply into Trinitarian communion. Um, and in a, but in a way that's really appetible, right? right? I mean, you, it, it's, a, it's a sign that is 
especially when explained, it is intuitively um, catechetical, right, about what God has done in salvation history, what he's doing with me now in grace. Uh, all of that is, is there in the sign to be explored, you know. Uh, so, yeah. Is Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yes, I have a book. Uh, I don't know what happened to the book, but uh, it's 30% th off now. <laughs> 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 um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, the, um, there's, I, I've given, yeah, 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 right. Uh, <laughs> I've given, uh, I've given a couple talks like this uh, on similar themes or other related themes through the Thomistic Institute, also through Washington. Some of those are on the podcast. Uh, at, for college students, usually that sort of thing. So. Do you mentor us here? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No. No. It's really a privilege to be back. It's. Uh, I really. Yeah. I've. Uh, I've really enjoyed my time here. And. Uh, yeah. I'll have to make up another excuse to come. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see. Yeah. No, so I haven't read that article. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're not exclusive realities, right? So there, there's a certain, when, when you think about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, um, there's a reason why. Uh, now, I, I suspect there's some, some liturgical scholarship over the last, over the 20th century, let's say, dur during the 20th century, tended to emphasize the, the Eastern liturgy really had this emphasis on pneumatology and the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, in, as the Holy Spirit in relation to the Father, and Western liturgy should recapture more of that. Maybe that's a source in some ways, but I, I think if you want to call it a Christological focus uh, the, uh, that the Latin rite tends to have, there's a lot of imagery about Christ in the Mass. Uh, I think, I mean, if you go to Mass, they listen to the prayers, observe the architecture of the church, uh, and just, the, it's all centered around, uh, a lot of it centered around the passion and its effects, right? I think that's its own gift, you know? It, it's, it's its own liturgical tradition which has an integrity about it which should be not only respected, but we, I mean, we can, we can gain a lot by, by exploring that without having to change it uh, as such. But uh, uh, there's nothing intrinsically um, uh, about any of that that would alienate us from the Father or anything like that. In fact, the, the priesthood of Christ in, in our humanity is really a return to the Father. So it's certainly referenced uh, implicitly. But I haven't read that article, so I, I, um, I can't respond to it. seems like a non-problem, I'm going to go ahead and say. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I, to, I mean, I don't want to dismiss his article. I'm sure there's, I should, maybe I should read it. But I, I, I you know, it seems like, I, like we're doing that. Yeah. Um, but it's good to remember the whole Trinity, right, as the exemplar and source, the reason we're doing any of this. Uh, and that the persons aren't somehow divided in a, uh, uh, an overly, you know, sensitive way or anything like that. I mean, they really are acting as one, you know, so... Uh, we appropriate, we talk about Trinitarian appropriation, or there's a, a connection, a special connection between one person and a certain um, a mission, you know, in, in the world. Uh, but that's uh, not to the exclusion of the others, certainly. Yeah, so I think you see a lot now with the Eucharistic revival of different reflections, you know, on where that should go, what we should be thinking about. I think it's good that people are talking about it, yeah. you know, and... Um, it's something all of us probably uh, would benefit from thinking about and praying about. You know, what difference will the Eucharist make for us, for our parish? How can we <coughs> explore more deeply the symbolism of the Eucharist in a way that's fruitful, in a concrete way? You know, so, yeah. Thank you, Father. Okay, great. <laughs>
inaugural Martin <laughs> Klein shirt, which... Uh, you want it? No, you keep it on. No. <laughs> so the inaugural Aquinas Lecture, which we hope becomes the annual Aquinas Lecture around this time uh, every year. Again, as Father Albert said at the beginning, uh, as a part of sharing our Dominican heritage with the parish, but also remembering the heritage of Aquinas High School uh, and its presence here in Columbus. Uh, and this is, a year in, this is special in particular because of the 750th anniversary of St. Thomas's death, which was last Thursday. And of course, as Father just mentioned, the Eucharistic revival. That's why we had a Eucharistic topic uh, for this year's inaugural Aquinas lecture, because we're in the year of the Eucharistic revival, the parish phase. So thank you again, Father, for coming. Please uh, stay tuned for future uh, adult faith formation events after Easter. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to venerate the relic of St. Thomas Aquinas in the gallery, tonight will be the last night that it will be on public display, so you're more than welcome to go now and venerate the relic if you haven't already or if you want to again. A reminder about this jubilee of St. Thomas Aquinas that the faithful can obtain a plenary indulgence under the usual conditions for making a pilgrimage to a Dominican church. So for our parishioners, that's every time you... Maybe you'll actually have to walk to St. Pat's, you know, to get the, you know, with the, the true sense of uh, pilgrimage. But um, that, the indulgence goes until January 28th, 2025, in honor of the 800th anniversary of St. Thomas's birth. So we still continue uh, this, uh, this celebration of St. Thomas Aquinas. So, Father, can we have your blessing before we all uh, certainly pray? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> May the blessing of Almighty God come down upon you. May he make the light of his face to shine upon you. And through the intercession of St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Dominic, and all the saints, may God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.